is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome to episode 157 of the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Kim Taylor Blakemore, and we are going to be talking all about historical fiction. So last week's question was, what month or season are you most productive in? And nobody replied. We had literally no comments. So I don't know if that was a bad question or what, but uh, I don't know what season you're most productive in. Perhaps that's the issue you guys don't know either. I suppose, thinking about it, it's a weird thing to track anyway. (laughs) I'm not sure anybody would necessarily uh, be cognizant of that. Anyway, this week's question is, what's the best TV show or movie you've seen this year? Uh, I ask that because I haven't watched TV for a little while, but we uh, say for this last week where we started catching up on the latest Game of Thrones installment I think it's uh, oh fuck what's it called House of Dra- House of Rings of How I think it's House of Power House of Rings of Dragon no Wait, I'm confusing the two. One's the Lord of the Rings thing right that one's Rings of Power and the Game of Thrones is House of Dragon <laughs> this is why <laughs> I always say I'm terrible with titles. I literally can never remember a single bloody title and why my books are always coordinated in color coding because I can only remember the picture. (sighs) Anyway, this week's book recommendation is Relentless From Good to Unstoppable by Tim S. Grover. Now, admittedly, this book is uh, for a certain type of person. (laughs) Um, It is... I find found it incredible. I, I'm still reading it. I'm listening to the audiobook at the moment. And it's very empowering. It, it talks a lot about trusting your own instincts, about trusting yourself, knowing your own decisions. And I find that uh, to be quite em- empowering. Everybody drink, my self-assurance loves it. Uh, but it is, I think, a great book to listen to anyway, if you are interested in sports. So Tim S. Grover is a, a coach who coached a lot of the... Um, um, amazing basketballers in the Michael Jordan era and so and he actually did coach Michael Jordan so if you are interested in Michael Jordan or basketball or any of the sort of big players at that time then the book might be interesting to listen to uh, purely from that point of view he's also got another one that I think is called winning can't quite remember but Tim's done a couple and they all kind of skirt around the same sort of topic and they're all equal. I I have loved all of them, obviously, because he's highly competitive, but uh, uh, clearly Michael Jordan was as well. So that's why it uh, appeals to me. But I think it does have universal appeal just in like the empowerment things that he's talking about. Anyway, personal update. I I have oh god, I literally do, I am absolutely fucked. I'm so tired today. I can barely like I I walked to school uh, to drop the kiddo off in this massive haze of just like foggy exhaustion. Um I have been going to boot camps and uh they are savage (laughs) they're amazing but they're also savage and so my body is exhausted uh my mind is tired because I'm drafting at the moment I uh think since last week I don't know if I gave you an update last week I think I'd only just started uh drafting when I did last week's podcast I've now I've just broken the 21,000 word barrier uh yesterday or the day before I think uh didn't really write much yesterday I've I sort of ground to a halt, hit a bit bit of a brick wall because my outline, cheers past Sasha, was a bit um, scant, shall we say. So I'm taking uh, today and a little bit of tomorrow just to um, pad that back out and do some brainstorming and then off I pop again. Hopefully I will uh, be back at the pace that I was doing. Um, so yeah, I have mostly been doing that. I finished off all of the things that I owed, uh, other people. I did some presentations and things like that. And, um, from next week, I know I am just like, I know it's delayed. Uh, but from next week, I will be also working on the audiobook. I think, um, as long as I don't sort of fall down too much of a uh, focus tunnel for the uh, book I am going to try and uh, get on with the finishing up the audiobook it's literally just editing it's driving me insane because it's so close to completion I just need to block the time to do it 
So hopefully I will do that next week. Fingers crossed, I'm not going to promise because <laughs> life gets in the way. Um, but I am now working to this uh, school term time, which I'm finding interesting. It is definitely motivating me in terms of better better deadlines like I found that when I just set a deadline it didn't really um what's the word it didn't really fire me up in the same way as knowing that I'm going for like a predefined date so the half term date because we're going up to um, Edinburgh in the October half term and uh, that is really helping to keep me focused. So I found that quite interesting. Um, in terms of other updates, I think that is probably it this week. I have literally just been either in the gym or wording or um, just, you know, finally clearing off those last few bits uh, of work. So yeah, I'm just going to move straight on, I think. Okay, Rebel of the Week this week is Saoirse Brennan. Saoirse says, I have a rebel story for you. Once upon a time, I was a married single mum of two boys who allowed my husband to run uh, uh, the run of the world. My one luxury as a woman was that I could bitch about it while accepting it as it is what it is. I did what is dictated by the typical Southern US doctrine and was super mum, super wife, super employed and attending grad school. Holy fuck. That is a lot. Oh, oh sorry. I like read ahead as, as I'm reading and this story is about to go downhill rapidly. And then he cheated. He had so much free time. I mean, how could he not? Oh my God, I'm so, this makes me so cross. Something snapped in my soul. I woke up and remembered myself. I filed for a divorce immediately, amazing, and channeled my grief through my writing, which I had neglected because I was everything to everyone else. Oh, I have written five and a half books since then. Amazing! And I'm about to release the third instalment in my Infidelity Investigator Files series. I live vicariously through my bad bitch, uh, bad bitch, of a main character and have rediscovered the bad bitch in me. Spoiler alert, I am destroying all my exes in my books. <laughs> I love that. I love that you empowered yourself. You finally put yourself first. Oh, I love this story so much. And I'm so sorry that you had to experience that as well, because what a bastard, if you don't mind me saying. <laughs> If you'd like to be a rebel of the week, please do send in your story. It can be any kind of rebellion, something big, something small, or something in between. It could be a pet story, a nan story. It could be any kind of story. You can email your rebel story to Becca over on rebelauthorpodcast at gmail.com. No new patrons this week, but a gigantic thank you to my existing patrons. Uh, it is Thursday the 22nd of uh, September as I record this and tomorrow evening Friday the 23rd we are going to have our uh, extra bonus session chit chatting and uh, yeah just Q&A all of that good stuff celebrating the fact that we have uh, over 100 patrons so thank you all so so much I really appreciate the support if you would like to support the show and get early access to all of the episodes as well as bonus content then you can from as little as two dollars a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. All right, I guess that's it from me this week. Let's get on with the episode. Hello and welcome to the Rebel Author Podcast. Today I am joined by Kim Taylor Blakemore. Kim writes historical novels that feature fierce and often dangerous women. She writes about the thieves and servants, murderesses and mediums, grifters and frauds, the women with darker stories, tangled lies and hidden motives. She is the author of the upcoming thriller, The Deception, Amazon best-selling historical thriller, thriller after Alice Fell, and The Companion, lauded by Publishers Weekly as a captivating tale of psychological suspense. She is also the author of Bowery Girl and Willa Literary Award for Best Young Adult Novel, Sissy Funk. Recipient of a Tuscan Festival of Books Literary Award, Willa Literary Award and three regional arts culture council grants. She is a member of Historical Novel Society, Mystery Writers of America and International Thriller Writers. She is founder of Novelytics, which provides workshops, developmental editing and a community to writers in the United States and Canada. She lives in the Pacific Northwest with her family. Hello and dogs, I will add. <laughs> Hello and welcome. 
Hello, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks oh, for having me on. You are most welcome. Thank you for joining me. Can I just say, I love the name Novelettics. Like that just oh, rolls off the tongue. Oh, that's <laughs> delicious. Way. I love like sometimes when you just hear a word and you're like, oh, I just love the way it, you know, like rolls around my yes. mouth. That's one of the words <laughs> I'm going to remember. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Um, so, I mean, that is one hell of a bio. Like, congratulations on on all of the things. Would you Would you like to tell everyone a little bit more about you and, like, kind of your your journey? How have you gotten to where you are today? Sure. Uh, well, I wrote all my life. I started with a tiny little book that my mother still has in her possession, all written in crayon. So that was a very good book. That's I adorable. <laughs> it was only five pages, but it was very, very good about a girl going to school. Aww. And then I wrote a book about a little haunted house and that she still has that. So Aww. that's when I started writing. Um, no, I said, done. she says I've written since I was very young. I think that I had a ginormous break because I ended up doing theater forever. Um, all the way from high school, college, and then I founded a theater company in Los Angeles and did a few plays, acting and being part of the production company. Realized I cannot take Los Angeles and big cities. and So I started writing when I was there. I was like, "There's the, LA is so crazy. I can't take it. I'm just going to stay in my house and control my world by writing a world. Said like um, a true writer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's like we, we don't really like chaos unless it comes from our pens, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So I had also stopped doing theater when I was there. And I really wanted to do something that was more giving back to people in the community. So I got my master's in orientation and mobility for the blind and did that for quite a while, teaching blind and low vision adults. And that moved me to Colorado. And when I was there, it snowed. And I'm like, I'm from California. I don't understand what this is. <laughs> my, my hair is freezing and like clicking against itself. And as I clean my car, uh, car windows of ice. And anyway, so it was snowing and I don't ski. And I was in Colorado. So I started writing there. And I started writing Sissy Funk, which is set in the Depression in Colorado. And I'm super into history. So my my thing to do when I was in Colorado was drive into Denver. I lived in Boulder and drive into Denver and just hang out at the historical museum because it was so fascinating. Anytime I go traveling anywhere, I'll go to a historical society, historical houses, you name it. That's my first stops every place. So I had written that book and um, that did got got an agent and then was published. And then from there, I was really interested in Fierce Bad Girls, so I wrote Bowery Girl about a pickpocket and a prostitute, and uh, it's kind of kind of went from there. I had a, you know, those two books were young adult, and I wasn't really keen on writing young adult books, so I stopped for a while trying to determine what I wanted to write, and in that time, of course, life gets in the way, and I was a dean at a college, and I moved from California to Boulder to Oregon, and uh, yeah, then I just somewhere in there I started writing the companion I was teaching writing and I was going to workshops and that character in the companion just came sort of floating out on her own and then she started knocking in my brain and then I couldn't stop I had to write her after putting her you know scenes of her aside for a while so so I do that weird things I do is I used to be a saber fencer um, and there's no fencing in the small town I'm at, so I haven't fenced in two years. Oh, I, that's so cool, though. It was really fun. I, I can say I've fenced all three weapons, so I've fenced <sighs> Epe, Foil, and Sabre over my over my life. None of them well, but <laughs> but I'm, I'm a dork. You know, I'm a writer. I'm like, I'm not going to go golf or bike. It's like, no, I must learn how to use an Epe. I always and then read think all the that, history around it. Yeah, but yeah. I, isn't that wonderful? Because I think writers have the quirkiest like hobbies and habits, and like none of us just do I don't know basketball or something, which is what my son's really into. Right. Like you know, one of my friends, Meg, she's an, an archer. She does archery, and I'm like, oh my god, oh, I so love archery. Badass. That's like, so fun, right? Isn't it? But it's yeah. like that's such an unusual sport. And uh, you know, I mean, I do more mainstream stuff. I do well. I I just 
finished doing martial arts, but I was doing martial arts for a really long time. And uh, I used to shoot, which is quite controversial in the UK because obviously, but like, we don't have the same do gun next. laws. Yeah. You yeah. do have very, your gun laws are a little different. They are very um, tight here. They are very tight. And this is, we're not going to get into gun politics right now, but no, I don't want to get into gun here. politics. <laughs> yeah. No, we won't get into those, but I see what you mean, though. It's the yeah. same sort of sports, right? So we have fencing, archery, shooting. Here we have clay pigeon shooting. Yeah, Which so that's easier here. You can do that. Super fun. Yeah. So I may try that next. It is fun. <laughs> uh, make sure you're feeling strong because the kick back in your shoulder can be like a little bit of a shock the first time you do it. Oh, um, wow. Okay. Okay. So you are now a historical novelist. And so yes. that is what we're going to talk about. Um, and so I wanted to just lay the groundwork for perhaps people who don't necessarily read uh, historical novels. Like what makes a historical, other other than obviously it not being set right now, um, but, but when does historical novel start? Is it 20 years ago, 50, 100? Like, what does that really mean? Mm -hmm. What makes a good historical novel a good historical novel? And, and yeah, like, what are those? And I'll ask that the craft question afterwards. Let, let's talk about the basics first. Sure. So historical novels are uh, technically anything that happened 50 years ago or before. Uh -huh. And that's a historical novel, which means I fall into the historical novel category in my life as a person, which is very <laughs> odd to be like, well, yes, your young, your little young childhood, you could have been in his, never mind. I don't want to go down the age road. <laughs> uh, so, okay. So historical novels versus a history or biography that you read. Um, obviously you have fiction involved, but when I look at how historical novels are sort of very different is you have characters that you have woven into a historical record. So you you may have fictional characters that end up in a an event that takes place that is well known or less well known, and sort of how those characters navigate within that world, whether it's historical fiction or historical thriller. It, the genre doesn't matter, but that is what I think makes it a novel versus a biography right and you're also looking for the unspoken and unsaid what where are the holes and blanks mm -hmm. that you can imagine or reimagine things now, and i went to a workshop once with um a guy who was a, a national book award finalist and he had ron hansen and he had said, you know, when you write historical fiction, you can do a lot of different things, but you cannot change an event that really occurred. So don't change it. If you've, if it happened, you know, he, he wrote stuff like he read, a, I don't even know the title. It's impossible. The Assassination of Jesse James by the Coward Robert Ford. He wrote that book. And he's like, I couldn't change the dates of when these robberies happened or when Jesse James was assassinated, but I can fill in all around it and sort of from your research into real characters, which he did in that book is sort of determine what they might have said in those. Okay. And so if you do start meddling with real events that occurred, then does that push it into fantasy or alternative history novels or like mm -hmm. more of that science fiction fantasy arena? Yeah, it definitely pushes it into that alternate history reality. Okay. And I think that if you wanted to push it into fantasy, into historical fantasy, that's that world seems to have more of a magical realism to it. Mm. Something's not quite what we see, whether it's supernatural or magical or you look at steampunk. Right. So there's things that were created in that that wouldn't have happened at the time period that makes it fantasy. And an alternate reality, maybe you have uh, President Lincoln not being assassinated and living yeah. and, you know, doing his thing. Um, yeah. OK. OK. So what 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 are the craft elements needed to make a historical novel hit the market correctly? What is it? craft wise that readers are really coming from you know like say for example you know you'll 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 read a, an urban fantasy novel and a lot of people are going to it for the sass and the snark of the the character set in a you know a contemporary kind of feeling what is it that people are going for like craft wise uh, uh and what will make a, a historical novel hit the market 
market well, do you think? Definitely do your research and it's the authenticity into the research and, and being as good as you can about not putting in things that are uh, anachronisms to the time period. I think that that helps hit the mark. And to me, it's really important that the character thinks in their time frame, not in ours. So I don't want to put a modern woman, slap a petticoat on her and put her in that time period. That does not tell me about the time and how people lived so can you thought. can you give me an example because that's fascinating and a really good point and i would never have thought of that i mean i don't write historical novels so that would be why i didn't think of it but that's so interesting to me do you have so so would would this be like sort of a, a woman who doesn't want to um see to a man for example or like what what is an example of that in practice well, in practice, if you and let's look at women like that, particularly because you're especially in historical fiction is where are the records of the women within there? So, you know, you look at diaries and letters and newspapers and find all that elements about what women's lives were like. And then how do you take that? Because we're we're sort of fed that women at the time were completely oppressed or they only had certain jobs and they couldn't do anything else. But if you peel back the record, there are people, who, women who were doctors and there were obviously the midwives and healers. And there were other women if to, that I called the women who live by wits and their grit, you know, both of those two things. And it's trying to find their stories. I don't know if I'm answering your question. You are. No, I'm fascinated. <laughs> um, by so but. It is doing it within their time. So in the deception, Clementine in there seems more modern than her time. She wears men's clothes. She goes out at night when she, and does what she wants. But she fits a mold of a woman who could have slipped through the cracks in that time period. Besides that, she does nefarious deeds, you know, so that sort of puts puts her in that in that mold. Um, so that's really important to me is where do they fit? How can I fit them in the cracks? What can they do in that time period? If you look back at the companion, which is completely domestic. So it's a very closed society, mill owner's wife, who's blind, the servant in the house and the cousin who lives with them because she's penniless and has no, no suitors. Right. So those three women, it's like, well, I could say they're all victims or I could look at all of them and watch their power plays together. And they have quite a bit of power, over the men and over their er arena they live in. So it's always surprising to me to find those within stories and not make them, again, not make them sound like they're from our era yeah. back then. Yeah, absolutely. One of my um, patrons, Eden, actually, who has asked you questions, they mm. are amazing at uh, ferreting out these rebel stories from history. Um, and they they just fascinate me because they're so, um, the, the people that they find are so um, out of their time kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And yet they are doing these incredible uh, feats of rebellion back in history. And I just, yeah, I do. Uh, Eden is single-handedly responsible for me uh, finding a passion for history again. So I'm sure they are listening and I hope they enjoy this little compliment I'm giving them. Well, uh, okay. well I will... I will ask Eden to please send me a list of those very cool women. I would love love to know that. <laughs> um, and, you know, this goes to something that you wrote, and that was um, about bold commanding and brave women are often shunned in society. And I think that plays into it, too, in those time periods. We love those bold women in those times, but man, did they come up against just wall after wall, and, you know, yeah. as they tried to do be who they were. And yet they are the um, inciters of the, the greatest change, I think, in history, which is what I find so fascinating. OK, so let's dig a bit more into craft and voice, like author voice, character voices. What do you think makes a good historical uh, voice in your book it reads and feels and sounds very different to contemporary like contemporary romance for example um like and that's the case right from scene atmosphere down to individual word choice so I wondered if you could speak to the craft of a good historical novel and give listeners some tips mm -hmm. your biggest tips is to read uh contemporary and I mean they're that time period contemporary 
the diaries, the letters, the newspapers, and novels from the period you're in. So what you're gaining is you're allowing yourself to sort of infuse your own brain and your own creativity with the stylistic choices of wordage and what they find funny, what they don't find funny, what's important in, in their world then. And you start seeing a little bit of the syntax of how they talk. Um, it gets a little difficult in newspapers because there is a, a very sort of formalized way they're written. But if you can get beyond that to read, for instance, trial records where they're quoting, they, the, the newspapers would go to trials and quote the entire day of a trial. And so they're quoting how people spoke. So if your trial takes place in rural Connecticut and you're listening to those suspects, whether they're upper class, middle class or a farmer or wherever they're from, you're going to see those dialect changes and how they look at the world and how they speak. So I would always look at those first. I come from theater, so I'm always constantly looking at voice and how people speak differently. So that that's helpful for me. Um, so those would be my very, very biggest point. Big craft no-no is making everything written with no contractions. I will go to this event. Yes, you can go to that event. <laughs> you know, we're not using haven't and can't and don't and all that. But if you stop doing that, thinking that that's what makes it historical, I see that when I'm editing um, people because I do developmental edits. I will see that and I'm like, you need to like, that's part you can make a little more contemporary. Otherwise, everyone sounds like a stilted prig. So. <laughs> amazing description <laughs> oh I love that um yes I think that's uh so true and and actually it's interesting isn't it because you can often see uh the lack of contractions in books like epic fantasy novels and so if you're seeing it there and they're not necessarily set in historical times then mm -hmm. that is not really the source of a historical voice so it really is mm -hmm. about word choice I like I'm thinking of like um you know like choosing the word oh, I'm feeling vexed you're vexing me right now you know that's yes. a kind of his, a, a word that is not you well I say it's not used in in modern times and uh, my wife works in a college and um so some of the 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 her lads uh, was like oh you're so vexing miss and uh she was like I, I, I think you're part of my grandmother uses that phrase like what do you on it's about? such a wonderful word though yeah yeah it's exactly. so good Okay, so word choice. So word choice is very important too because words change meanings. So I have two dictionaries. Are they over here? One is the original Webster's Dictionary that was written in 1823. And I have a travel dictionary from 1844 that I found on eBay because wow. I wanted to make sure that I was using words correctly. They did change meanings. It's certain different words as you go along change meaning. So you want to be flip through them and look at the words, you know, I can just like flip through that 1844 dictionary and be like, Oh, that's an amazing word. Um, you can use Ngram that's on Google and you type in the word and it will tell you when it started being used, like in a graph, when was the, that word actually used, I right? No Parasol, idea. Parachute. Yeah. When are these used? When was a zipper? It was the word zip used before zipper. Well, you know, let me look it up. So all of those are like these little word choices, making sure you're using the right word for whatever the things are in the house at the time. Oh, which may this change. is fascinating to me. <laughs> I love this. I would never just... Um, Number one, I would never have thought to look for a historical dictionary because that's mm -hmm. I just that that blows my mind. That is such a good tip. And um, the other one is the just going back to what you said earlier was about the the trial records and looking at journals and newspapers and things. I think that is bloody brilliant. Like I would never have thought of that. But like I mean, I, I I I'm I'm guessing people need to go to sort of the larger sort of more state libraries to look for records like that or can you do it online uh, or Uh when I go you can do some of those online for the diaries and records some are digitized, but I highly suggest going to where you are setting in your novel. It's pretty important. You can meet with the state library, the archivist, go to the historical society, and they will, if you say, hey, I'm writing a novel about such and such person, they will bring you on a table 
all the records and different newspapers and you can just sit there and read them. Amazing. And so super important to do that to I me. Love it. Yeah. Another thing you can use that's super cool is whatever year you're writing in, see if you can get the Sears Roebuck catalog if you're writing in the US. Or uh yeah, the Sears Roebuck catalog. So I was trying to write a book in post World War II in the home front here in California. So I have a nineteen forty five Sears catalog. And within it, I can see what's rationed and what's not, because it shows you which shoes are rationed, which shoes are not. So if you have women going into a store trying to get clothes, you know they're going to look, the leather shoes are going to be up front. They can't afford them, but the rationed ones are in the back. So you can go. So you're doing telling details, right? I'm not talking about the whole store and the rationing that happened and all this blah, 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 blah. You do it in one moment, one moment of a character moving through a, through a store. I need shoes. Those are too expensive. The ration ones are back there. I still have two stamps. You've done it. You've just set the period. Oh, you're amazing. This is incredible. Like, it blows my mind because the level of detail in historical novels is like... And, and, you know, I say this and I'm sure somebody who doesn't write fantasy would be like, but how do you make up so many details? And I'm like, I don't know. I just fucking make it up. Like... <laughs> But, like, but you have to in fantasy because you're talking like this totally part of the joy yeah. of fantasy is like immersion in every detail of the world. Yeah. Yeah. But I you just know? it blows my mind that because like I think his, historical novels terrify me because of the level of detail, like an attention to detail. But historical reader, historical novel readers really like accuracy and so that's something that like really terrifies me because I'm not sure I have enough attention to detail to ever like attempt it but I do I like I want to write in all of the genres but anyway um okay so you mentioned earlier about bold women and mm -hmm. I wanted to just come back to this what do you think is the key to creating fierce female characters uh, as we've already said you know bold commanding women are often ostracized or like shunned in society um but in my opinion they're the most fun people <laughs> they're the most kick-ass um so how do you like balance that in fiction um yeah and how do you balance I know you sort of said like uh people that fall between the cracks but I, I'd love to go deeper in that and for you to tell me more about how you do that how you've created some of your characters I just like the characters that are always trying to go against the grain uh, and they can't help it. It's not that they have any political agenda or they woke up one day and said, I'm going to be the greatest suffragist in the world. Not that I've written about suffragists. I'm like, as I said in my bio, the, the people I write about are the frauds and grifters. So um, I, I think I, I don't know. I've just always been inspired by people, women particularly, who are just like very um, single minded. Whatever that is, they pick it and they're going to do it. If they need to survive, this is how we're going to do it. It's a lot of action. You know, there's they're not like navel gazing or sitting around or being like, oh, I need to help everyone else, which is a very common theme of women. Right. We got to take care of the other people first before we take care of ourselves i think they don't they're like i take care of myself first and then i can help you along maybe i don't I know if that's that. even an answer <laughs> oxygen mask put your own oxygen mask on first um okay so Patri i love that can yes. i do that you have to put your own on first to save everyone else if exactly. you're saving them. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so I mentioned Eden earlier. So uh, mm -hmm. Eden says, how do you balance historical and the fiction? At what point does historical fiction become fantasy with historical elements? Fantasy with historical elements is going to have more of those otherworldly, not rooted in reality, our reality time historical fiction you can be placed within a real time and place um whether you're doing a fictional story the town you're in is still real you could look up a newspaper and you could see all the the elements and i think that's what makes historical fiction versus historical fantasy excellent excellent are there when you so i'm gonna try and get my words out <laughs> when you talk about people who are still living 
there are issues with like libel and slander and things. Is that not the case when you are talking about people who have passed away already? Yes. I went over this because there was two books, one that I'm start doing research on now, one I was going to do, um, where that was an issue. I wanted to, they had living relatives and I wanted to see if I wrote something fictional about them, like take their life and then say, hey, I want to do something kind of kick ass with them. Um, what do I have to do? Do I have to get permission from these people? So one was a woman named Audrey Munson, who was a model for for sculptors in New York City at the turn of the last century. And she was incredibly famous. In fact, most of the statues of women you see around New York City are her. No way. So I really wanted to do her. And there's a lot of reasons I wanted to do her. One, in the end, she ended up being put in an asylum when she was 20 something and didn't never left. She died like at, in her 90s in the asylum. But I wanted to know what happened to do that to, to this anyway. So she was an interesting thing. She was the first one. I said that if there's any living relatives and I want to do her story, I better see. So there's no like living relatives that are close, but there was two distant cousins and they both had historical museums about her. And they were both, one was, a, let me take that back. One was a late cousin, a distant cousin. The other was the cousin of the woman who lived in the same apartment with her mother at some point, at something crazy. So these two guys hated each other and were absolutely like not wanting to give me any of the research. Like, what are you going to do to Audrey? What are you going to do? I'm like, I just want to write a book. I just want to see, I need to know her life first. And I was like, this is too much. I can't have them because they'll just end up being, you know, whatever they do. You didn't write her right or how dare you put her in a historical thriller, or whatever you do with her. So I gave up on that. And then Another is that I'm writing about next um, is about Lola Baldwin, who was the first female police officer in the U.S. And she's right in, was right in Portland. So I really wanted to write about her and her women's um, protective division that she ran for a long time in Portland. And she has two grandchildren. I don't know if they're still alive. I've seen interviews with them. So I'm in the process. I have a research assistant who's trying to track down if they're still alive. So I because I do want to talk to them. And what I did in turn, I, I, I don't write about real people because of this issue. It's like, I don't want to get it wrong. I was going to put in after Alice fell, I had an, there's an asylum in that. And I was going to do it at the real state asylum in New Hampshire. And I realized I don't want to give someone a terrible reputation if I don't know if they deserved it or not, however far in the past they are. So, um, yeah, you um, don't have to get any permission. It's just a nice thing to do. <laughs> uh, okay, that's interesting. I um, I love that uh, first story of, of the sculptor. I wonder if you could fictionalize it enough that you could, you know, have a very similar story because that sounds yeah. amazing. Um, I know. But I think I'm going to do that. I think I'm going to fictionalize the character completely, but use that idea of New York and, and yeah. that time period when they were building all the sculptures in the city. Yeah, yeah, unbelievable. Um, that's interesting though that you don't need permission if they're if they're if they're long long gone. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, what are the most important research elements that need including in order to give it that historical feel? You mentioned just um, sort of including like the odd detail about the rations and and things like that. But are there it's some uh, elements that are more important than others? Um, is it like scene setting or dress and outfits or, or or yeah, what is it really that I mean? Is it everything? Um, how you know like how detailed do you have to go with the research? I certainly think it depends on what you're writing in terms of historical fiction. Each each historical fiction person is different. Some do com incredible detail about the room and the clothes and the carriage and whatever they're doing. And for me and how I like to write is I like to use telling details. So again, like the ration card, et cetera, you do, it's doing the same thing. What can I use that's going to show the reader the time, but drop them in it. So they're a little bit at unease, like, I have to navigate this world too. So, you know, if I'm doing a street and it's the 
19th century and it's pouring rain. I'm not going to say it's pouring rain in the street and it's very muddy and the mud's been here and we've never paved the street and this town's been here since 1763. And, oh, look at the interesting inn, you know, things like that. I don't do that. But I will say the carriage lurched as the wheel got stuck in the mud. The woman on the corner lifted her the hem of her skirt and sighed because the bottom was completely covered and ruined. A dog is shivering under an overturned laundry tub, you know, so you're using these very, very specific images to build it. And this is something for me that I have to dial back all the time. So I put in all the details because atmosphere is very important to me, using the weather as part of the tone of the story and, and using it as part of the plot. You can use it for so many things, you know. Um, and my editor in the last book said, okay, you've talked about the peeling paint enough. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> okay. So that was the last book. I got it. Don't describe the rooms in detail. So we just described, you know, the piano that had one key off or the chair, horsehair chair or whatever, things like that. And then the next one, she said, as we're building it toward more of a faster paced book, she said, take every section where you have description. And if you see that you've got four or five sentences, I want you to cut it to one or two. And that was a great exercise because I didn't need it all. Yeah, that's brutal. And it wasn't though. painful. I was <laughs> like, oh, she's right. This totally slows down the scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If somebody's chasing someone and they're like running for their life and they start describing the fog and the light coming through the windows of the house, <laughs> no, you're running for your life. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> You'd be more worried about whether or not your thighs can hold out through the burn. Your thighs can hold out. The <laughs> road's too dark because everything was so dark before electricity. Yeah, oh, of course. And See, oh, this, it's almost like you are a historical novelist. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was. It was terribly dark. So when people went someplace, it'd be, you'd be scared. Yeah, yeah. You know? oh. had one lantern. Yeah, yeah, this is so interesting to me. I have a, talking about weird quirks that writers have, I, I'm obsessed yeah. with lampposts. <laughs> I, I, so all, well, once upon a time, I was walking through castle grounds because I also have a bit of a thing for um, architecture. I am not in any way mm. detailed, but my favorite thing to do is go and visit like a British castle or old derelict mansion or whatever. And um I was walking through a park and I walked past a lamppost and a whole story dropped into my head. Like shit, you know, the whole story dropped into That's my head. Amazing. Yeah. And and I and I wrote the story over the summer and I wrote it in three weeks just because like I it was literally like the muses had given it to me and I just vomited it onto wow. paper. But, but but I'd been intellecting on this story for like probably four years before I wrote it. And uh -huh. I happened to mention this story on Instagram and now I get sent all of these lampposts from all over the world and it literally Really brings me so much joy I love it I have literally probably awesome. about 300 photos of lampposts but like anyway I don't even know how I got into this it's not even relevant but lampposts are amazing they are they're amazing and like Victorian gas ones and oh yeah I just love it all exactly um and now I'm showing how geeky I am <laughs> <laughs> okay so Eden also says, are there any periods of history that lend themselves better to historical fiction? I find the Vikings seem to be quite popular, but they often fall into the make them hairy and savage and wear lots of leather tropes, which is a shame. Give me historically accurate Northmen. Yeah, that made me laugh out loud when I read that, because that is so true. If you get into like historical romance, right, you've got those, the Vikings as we know it uh <laughs> wear lots of leather so good um i can't stand those books when they do that and it's like you do the research it's all new there's a ton of been a ton of new research on vikings recently um and i i like that idea of like are there periods that lend themselves better to historical fiction i think every period is fascinating um i'd love to go back to ancient egypt myself and uh, see yes see see what it was like i really want to go to elizabethan england really badly <laughs> i want to see one of shakespeare's plays done for the first time mm. and be there you know things like that but i don't think in terms of historical fiction one category over another or one era over another i think that each of the writer's passions for it brings out you know what what you want 
I know right now the big trend in the U.S. is World War II fiction, and that seems to go strong, and and also Victorian uh, sort of Victorian crime and thriller is popular here. I don't know what's popular in the U.K. I don't know. I don't. I'm. 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 You you write fantasy. Just stay with yeah, that pose. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's hard for me. And I, I very nearly slipped up and because I'm working under a pen name now. And uh-huh. uh, I very nearly was like, I, I don't know because I'm reading blah, blah. Um, <laughs> but, so I have to like keep all of the things that I'm reading like off my Goodreads that are like sensitive or whatever. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah. So I, I don't know. I don't know. I think the Victorian era is something that I mm-hmm. always see Brits very fascinated about because it was mm-hmm. such such a big time of change in in the UK but no I don't know mm-hmm. I'm gonna have to ask some of my uh patrons who write historical uh fiction of which there are a few and one is CJ Dinton who says any tips on organizing research to make it easy to reference whilst drafting and editing yes a couple things cite everything so take notes of where like use a citation generator and make sure you keep up to date on every single article website and book you've read Uh, because when you get to the end and you're facing the copy editor they're going to ask you if that was where you got the fact oh wow and at least i've had that happen and then i can say from this journal or from this the, that that little 1844 dictionary went back and forth she's like we don't use that word we use the chicago manual of style it's this word and i'd say well it's the wrong word for the period and here's the word wow and and what's used so i would say keep a site list keep that like in a folder somewhere listing every single one of those keep notes um uh whether you i use i put everything on my ipad so then i highlight and do notes on that but it will then, when you highlight, I have a left column on everything and it will state like character, use, add, do you have this in, think about act two, so I can reference throughout. But I I definitely, definitely say use a citation manager. And also don't create, don't go crazy with research. Like if you're studying, if I'm doing, um, like I was doing the spiritualist movement for right for the deception. Well, that's a pretty ch- long chunk of time. So maybe I'll read something to get an overview of who the big players are between 1844 and 1910. But the book takes place in 1877. So once I pick the time and I will pick the year and the month and even the day days of the book, put them on a calendar and then I'll go to newspapers.com and read newspapers from the time because that's the character's place. That's what they see and only what they see. They don't know what happened in 1910. They don't know about Houdini, right? So then you've like really pushed your research down into their world at that time and walking with them. Absolutely fucking genius. I love this so much. Um, Okay, so Robin Pierce says, if you're writing relatively recent historical fiction, um, i.e. the last 200 years, and there are family members still alive. Okay, so I think we've probably covered this. Um, Is there any, I don't think there's anything else we've left out. So the question is basically around whether or not you need to um, seek approval. Um, Is there a line if it's biographical or is it just if they're dead then you don't need to ask permission um yeah if they're dead you don't have to legally you don't have to ask permission from anybody okay but to be kind you might want to yes yes so i sasha is a pen name and uh a family member wrote about another family member (laughs) who has passed and it caused quite a lot of friction, shall we say, mm. <laughs> because permissions were perhaps uh, sought and denied and the book went ahead anyway. Uh, so, yes, like I definitely know that uh, asking permission is uh, appreciated, shall we say. OK, so you mentioned earlier about pace and cutting out some of the description. Um, I wondered if you could speak to the craft of that. Historical novels can occasionally be on the slower side. Um, And I wondered, like, you know, and some of that is because you need a lot of detail to make it authentic. It's completely, you know, non uh, here and now. And so I just wondered, like, how you create that pace, how you um, 
keep the reader hooked uh, while still having enough detail to make the book uh, authentic and feel depth and and feel feel like it's full of depth and re- real to the reader. Mm-hmm. Again, I think it's the genre. I think if you're doing straight historical fiction, you have a lot more uh, luxury in how much you put in details because that's what people are looking for. So if you're writing a story about the Lewis and Clark Trail, boy, do you want to know the detail as they traveled the whole U.S. and the different tribes they met and the different people and animals and stuff. So it's, you know, that lends itself to that. But when you start getting into more of suspense and mystery and thriller, you have to be much more careful. And and that's back to those telling details is picking just what you need to make it the period. Make sure you're in their head, not in a 20th century head. Um, and just cut those details to the minimum and keep shorter chapters. And I'm still struggling with this. And it's like, Each book I've gone, I want it faster. I want it to move faster. How do I make it move faster? So it's doing more action, ending each of your chapters with some sort of question or cliffhanger. These are very common to any fiction writing. Um, And the next one I'm working on, well, I'm finishing up one now that's not like this, but the next thriller I'm working on, I've decided every chapter is five pages or shorter. Oh, I love that. Oh, yeah. And so (laughs) I want to see what that does, you know, and I think every book has a challenge. You got to give yourself a challenge. And this one, I was like, I want a true thriller, but I'm setting it in 1908. So I love it. it. How do I do that? That's amazing. You know, Caleb Carr wrote The Alienist and that does that. He's got full on thriller mode. And I'm like, how do you do that? (laughs) deconstruct it deconstruct it i know i know i'm decon i've got it i've started i'm like i but i get too into it i'm like i can't even pull back and go he used this and these short sentences and this short paragraph i'm just like ah oh, it's page 120 oh my god what's happening to the characters are you a rereader of books uh no okay so i've so- read a couple books more than once i've read a couple jeanette winterson's more than once so what I was going to say, if you're, so my last book was about deconstruction. And uh, one of the things that I say in there is if you are a rereader, it's almost easier to deconstruct because mm-hmm. you yes. can read once, know the story, and then you don't get sucked in. Whereas I'm not a rereader, so I have to deconstruct on the way through. <laughs> which oh, makes it, Yeah, it does yeah. make it harder. But yeah, if you are a rereader, I was going to say, just power through to the end and then go back and, and reread like and, and do the deconstruction. Um Okay, well, this is the Rebel Author Podcast. So tell everyone about a time you unleashed your inner rebel. Oh, my goodness. How many times? No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a huge rebel. I Let's see, I went to drama school and I should have studied for a stable career. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's kind of a big rebel in the, my family. At the time, my father's a doctor. I think he expected me to go that way, except uh, blood makes me cry. Oh, no, I couldn't do it. Uh, Well, let's see what other time my inner rebel, I consider that being wild, not necessarily being rebels. I, I flew off to Poland and Prague to have a short lived romance. Oh, I love it. Yeah, it was very short lived. But you know, Poland and Prague are really interesting. And I think, I think, uh, I had one of those in uh, in LA. I got on, uh, I went to see somebody and then I got on a Greyhound bus and and basically went 11 hours on the Greyhound bus down to LA from San Fran just to, just to have a short romance. <laughs> it's amazing. You know, you have to do that once in your life. You do. I, I felt you do. so like, you know, getting on that plane. I just like out of the, I'm coming, I'm coming to Poland. I've got yeah. my ticket. It's tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, I literally did that. <laughs> yeah. It's incredible. I love that so much. I think everybody should do that once in their lives. You, you uh, need to do that. It, it's so fast. Great. And then I, I just think the other thing was I gave up nine to five. I just, you know, I write and I edit and that's what I do. And I, if I take the the ups and downs with it. Yeah. Oh, and isn't that just living the dream, right? All of the pressure, but also living the dream. (laughs) It is. It's both. And I can wake up every morning knowing there's more to do in the day than there is day, but it never feels like work. Yes. Oh, exactly. I couldn't agree more. I spent uh, three hours drafting today and I just 
fucking giggled and laughed and I danced around my office and I was just like this this is what I have been working for like unfortunately I don't get to do that all of the time <laughs> but don't you love though when a scene works perfectly like oh yeah like I listen to my scenes on Speechify I use that so I can hear it and I have Gwyneth Paltrow's voice on it I love so- it she reads it and like yesterday I was just laughing my head off at a scene in a book. I'm like, that character is hilarious. Yeah. And then I'm like, I know how to write. And yes. that doesn't mean that'll be saying that today I'll be yes. like, oh my God, I should go back and do accounting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I totally, totally 100% agree. I changed uh, genre and kind of. Um, Ooh, that's fun. How do, how do I explain what it is? I don't know. I ch- I, I'm changing some of the thematic stuff that's in the, in the books and to make it more uh well I'm gonna be very careful um it just resonates more with me and uh it's made it so much easier to write I feel like for the first time in my life I'm actually writing the stories that I should have always been writing um and that is just makes it so much more fun so yeah I love that okay tell everyone where they can find out more about you and your books and your developmental editing services and anything else that you would like to add Absolutely. It's very easy to find me. You can find my website at kimtaylorblakemore.com. Pretty easy. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, which I is my favorite <clears throat> place to be. That's Kim Taylor Blakemore Books. And Novelytics has its own site with all of the services we offer and the community. We have a wonderful writing community. And that is novelytics.com. Excellent. I think that's the only one I don't have. So I'll make sure I've got that from you afterwards. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today. And of course, a gigantic thank you to all of the show's listeners and the show's patrons. If you would like to get early access to all of the episodes, you can do so by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. I'm Sasha Black. You are listening to Kim Taylor Blakemore. And this was the Rebel Author Podcast. Join me next week when I will be joined by Shane Miller talking all about how to plot your novel. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review.